So Megan, welcome to the Layered Onion Podcast. I'm very excited to have you here. Thank you. So maybe you could introduce yourself and so people know, but you have a very eclectic, varied <laughs> background. Yeah. So maybe you could um, just tell us about yourself. Sure. Uh, currently, I work for Ordained by Local, which is a nonprofit that supports local businesses. Um, and that could be other nonprofits. It could be large organizations. It's just as long as it's locally owned. Um and I guess I never thought I would have begin that world, but it kind of makes sense. I, like you said, my history has been very diverse between counseling and um, clinical pastoral education, and let's see, construction work, and just a lot of <laughs> and, and coffee roasting. You know, you put that all together, all of them done under small businesses or locally owned businesses, and this is kind of a perfect fit right now. And I really, really am enjoying it. Um, and it's a really important time in the community and in our systems to be trying to support local businesses because it's just a very pivotal, kind of reminds me like, not that I, I was born, but not that I know what the experience was like, but the 70s, how I feel like the 70s must have felt to people that were trying to revolutionize things and change things and join, make collectives and cooperatives. And that's where it feels like that to me right now. And so I feel like a really important place to be. I'm really honored that I get to like, it's wonderful to work with different businesses and hear their stories and, mm -hmm. and defend their stories and go around and talk about their stories. Uh, I, um, just this past week and a half, maybe, uh, two weeks, we've had two restaurants close in the village I live in. And, um, we were at a meeting together and I just was struck by your discussion and passion, frankly, about how tough it is for these local businesses to um, make it. And I think that's a, a story that's not really told. It is not. So maybe you could, you know, spend a little bit of time on that because it, it, I just found myself really engaged. Yeah. And I think it's not talked about as much, not because no one wants to talk about it. I think it's because, you know, um, the people that, know about or experiencing it don't have the time or the capacity or even want to admit that this is what they're struggling with because in any business you and you start in a business even if you're choosing selecting to exit out of the business or you decide to retire there's going to be like grief and there's going to be this did I fail looking back to do everything right so when you are put in a position where you're forced to make those decisions it's not something you want to be like sharing loudly and you assume everybody else, just like parenting or anything else, social media, you look at and go, oh, everyone else seems to be doing fine. What's wrong with me? Mm -hmm. So I think part of it is just that that threshold of not feeling comfortable talking about it is one. But secondarily, part of owning a local business, specifically restaurants, is not having any time. And at the end of the day, the thing that you need to do most is care for yourself and usually care for your family because most restaurant owners have families. So then going, well, you know what? I should seek some support <laughs> and I should show up at that village meeting and I should go talk to the economic development board and I should let people know what we're struggling with. That's just, it's just not happening. And it's not because they're failing or because they're not doing a good job. It's just the capacity is just not there and vice versa. You know, you, on the flip side of things, if you're working on developing a new area and you're working on like, okay, how are we going to make the best thing we can for this community? You're talking to the people that want the best for that community and have the most to spend on that community. And um, so I think there's a big gap between the, the two different realities. They both exist, but there's just no communication. There's no connection between the two. So, um, and I think right now we're seeing a really significant middle class. Um, I don't know how you describe it. Just like it's ex imploding, exploding mm -hmm. as the systems were we're breaking down and then COVID hit and pandemic hit and everyone like, oh, I don't know how we've been making it work this long, whether it's healthcare, whether it's food, and everything is kind of like crumbling. People are rebuilding. The middle class is the one, and I don't mean middle class, I don't even know how you would define that, but I'm just saying people that had disposable enough income to go to a restaurant, people that own a restaurant, typically you're going to have like enough to get by for your family, maybe. Mm -hmm. People can't make that choice right now. They don't have that you know, if you, coffee shops are doing amazing. Coffee shops are doing amazing because they're in that one little price bracket that people can still afford. And while they're there, they can also work or they can meet people, but you can't take your whole family out for dinner anymore. 
Or if you do, then you got to make all these other choices. Um, and I think there's a lot of realities that no one talks about. So many business owners don't pay themselves for years after they open. So people think, oh, you must be a restaurant or you must be wealthy. Mm-hmm. So many of them are not. So many of them will go three, four years without ever giving themselves a salary. That doesn't mean they're not having any profit. It just means it all goes in back into the business. And they have not had enough profit to set aside, I'm going to get paid this much a year. Mm-hmm. That's that's a really ugly situation. And in Madison, I'm sure other places, but right now in Madison area and the surrounding counties, like we are areas, we have so much priority on values. Like we're in Madison. We live this kind of lifestyle, right? We value these things. We're going to have, we're going to take care of our employees. We're going to provide a living wage. All these things are super important and a reaction to a broken system. But the flip side of that is business owners, typically a lot of them aren't being able to insure themselves mm-hmm. or their family. Like I'm living on principle alone and goodwill <laughs> and right. saying that doesn't work anymore. And so it's a long answer to what you said, but there is just this disconnect between the reality and even those of us who just think of, oh, I just went and got my coffee across the street. And there's a lot of staff working. It's going really well. They're always busy. Life's good. You know, there's that disconnect. And Well, I was really struck, and I think it's a great example of what you're talking about between the two, those developing yeah. um, and those actually living in the local yeah. world, is that there's all these developments, and in fact, all up and down the yeah. corridor we're on, but often there was is they're making their money on the living units above yes. and the restaurants or the storefronts that are below are really sort of the gravy profit. Yes. Those are the break even up above and these are the gravy profit. So they don't want to bet on local businesses anymore. Absolutely. And they're really renting when they set that rent <clears throat> threshold, it's above what a local business can afford for almost and sometimes I'm really surprised every once in a while when I see one and I kind of want to just go in and say, what rate did you negotiate? Or what is what are you giving up to be at this location? Because most of our locally owned businesses, um, you know, it's between $25 a square foot is what a lot of them, you know, like Verona, for example, if you wanted one of their new developments have retail space, $25 a square foot. When you add that up, that's huge. Whereas, you know, some people are paying 10, right? Mm-hmm. So it's a huge, and it's just down the street from each other. Um, so that was a really, it is a really good point. Um, and I think that there's a couple ways to, like, if you were the developer, you would probably say like, oh no, that's not accurate. I'm not, that's not my gravy. Mm -hmm. I have it factored in and I have to fill this space, but I gave myself three years to fill it. So it is, you know, (laughs) how each person defines it Mm -hmm. is that's where people be like, no, no, that's not the truth. But when you're on the bottom end of that, and I don't mean the bottom of like, economy but you're the person that wants to get in that space and you can't reach the the developer and you can't reach the you just have to work with their that first level up above you that's not ha- you don't understand that and they're not sharing that and it's it's just it's going to keep happening until it can't until all these are empty well and and that is something i mean an organization deigned by a local um and the idea that we have Dame by Local Arts, and we have all these different efforts really about trying to revive and have a local right. business community, but yet it seems like development is working against it. What, from a policy perspective, are some opportunities for uh, Dame by Local or others to influence yeah. kind of the process? Well, and that's hard because we are such a nonprofit driven community. So Dane Arts is part of the county, but it's, you know, it's most of these organizations that are doing the communicating on behalf of the small businesses are nonprofits, which doesn't allow them to be in a political advocacy role. Mm -hmm. So there can't be influencing. I can't go to, uh, you know, I can't go to a senator and say, I've got 10 new businesses who are going to fight this or we want to sign up. We can't do that or we would lose our insurance. We would lose our our status. So for us, it's about educating folks on what is the best for them. And for us, it's first we have to step into all those spaces mm-hmm. and not as an adversary or as an advocate or an influencer but to go into the Economic Development Board meetings and just listen and then just give information 
be just the connector and the communicator. That's our main purpose. But the hard part is getting the businesses to tell us what information needs to go in and for the, them to be able to receive us and go, who are you? Why should I listen to you? Um, so I can't really speak to policy because I legally can't. Mm. It's just not something I can do. But I do really encourage people to start at the, it's so overwhelming, but start at the most basic base you're in. If you have a restaurant, who is the district representative? Do that research. Most people like, my what? You know, because you're like, if I live in the city, I know who the mayor is. Mm -hmm. um, but start with who's your district representative or go to a neighborhood association meeting and you'll get the vibe of your neighborhood and who's representing you. And then who who surrounds that? And then who can you reach out to? Um, so what resources, coming to Dan by Local, if you're a business owner, is a really great resource because we can go directly to them. We can't, again, we can't affect policy, but we can be the person that runs up ask the question, runs back, kind of like middle school dating or something, right? Like passing letters. <laughs> <laughs> because the fact is the business owners are too, back to the same question, they're too busy. Mm -hmm. It's not built into a business plan to allow for you to understand politics and show up at a economic development board meetings and to do all this stuff. It's just not. And when you're struggling, it's even lower on your priority level, even if it's the one thing that might save you. Mm -hmm. So really rely on resources in the community that exist, the connectors, and so Noah, who we've been talking about, he works for Reap Food Group. He also works for Dane County Food Collective. Dane County Food Collective is an amazing resource for that specifically, um, just to contact them. And we always say, just throw stuff at us and we will see what we can get out. Mm -hmm. And Because even if we can't advocate or even if we don't know, there is somebody in, a net, in the network of our world that does know. And I think that people need to start, like I said, a collective thinking, that collaborative thinking. You cannot do it alone. Well, it makes me think of, and I know you can't talk necessarily policy, but you think of all the TIFs yep. and these, you know, are supporting so much of the yeah. development. So the the city or village or whoever is foregoing tax base, mm -hmm. but they have some leverage yes. to say, well, we'd like to see some percentage or element. Yes. They do it often with... Um, uh, what I would consider equitable housing, yes. um, but also to think about the businesses would be nice as a part of that process as well. Very, very much so. Yeah. And, you know, I went to a presentation not too long ago by one of these developers and hearing them say straight on the front end of their, their talk was, we are not classified as a, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, a uh, multi-use like a multi-economic space. Like that's mm -hmm. not what we're, it's not affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And so if you start with this is not affordable housing, there's one set of expectations. But if you apply for affordable housing, that's where some of the things, if you as a developer, you're going to be develop affordable housing, there needs to be much more advocacy and structure involved in that piece. And so, and then if that could then be Obviously, it's going to scale down as you get into luxury apartments. They don't need to have the same things that an af affordable housing does. But we're talking about just basic human rights, being involved mm -hmm. in the decision-making process versus po politics and money. And it's really, really hard. And then when it goes back, you're going to the next step. Who has the property? Who gets to win that contract in the city that they're developing? And who's fighting for that? What's going to get the city the most? Being able to have that impact at an economic development level when they're deciding, who are we going to give this contract to? How much of this is going to be affordable housing? How much of this is going to be jobs? And if we add this many jobs to a community, how are these many employees going to get here? Can these employees afford to live in our town? Right now, any city in Madison as well can't afford most of the employees that they're building these spaces for. Mm -hmm. So all of these lower units, these mixed use, it's a great idea, but you're filling it with we're going to have some elderly care. We're going to have some grocery stores. We're going to have some coffee shops and restaurants. That's all of what we have as like less valued employees in this world. I don't think they're less valued, but financially they're not as highly valued. And they can't afford the apartments, so they have to ride the bus. Mm -hmm. Buses aren't getting to some of these cities. So <laughs> it's a vicious cycle. It is. And, and, and like what I was trying to say in the meeting we were at too is there aren't any bad guys I think there are bad actors at times. So when a small business takes on that victimized role, like this, the city did it to me, the developers are doing this to us. I think you it cuts off that potential for those communication chains to happen. 
Because once you have a bad guy, you have something you can either fight or run away from, fight or flight. Mm -hmm. And neither of them are effective communication tools. <laughs> so when you're not approaching it as this person has got to be a bad guy, the develop world of developers are all bad. Um, it's just not true, but it's it, it makes it easy to walk away from something. And, um, and then you stop looking for resources like people that can do the communicating for you or can do the connecting for you. Um, and empower you to affect change and affect policy. And sometimes it's just having your words recorded. You know, some of the most effective conversations I have had is to an economic development board in a city and just saying, you know, this is one of the businesses you're most proud of. That person does not has not paid themselves in four years and they're on Badger Care. I use that story a lot because it's so vividly true. And they're just like, that can't, that can't be true. There's just such a disconnect. You need somebody to go in there and they, then they go like, oh, well, how many of our businesses are in that position? Uh, if no one ever asks them the question, they're not going to typically look for the answer unless they're coming from the experience of needing of advocacy. Well, and many of them have not run their own small business, so they just don't understand some of, some of the barriers that exist. Yeah. And how many hats a particular person has to wear yeah um that aren't yeah. maybe the major reason they went into business so that's you're we always say about <laughs> by local like that's you go into business because you're passionate about something right or you're like hey i can make some money at this neither of them mean you're good at the 50 plus skill sets it takes to run a business right <laughs> and you know lots of times what we see too locally is business will grow 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 and people are like super excited like oh they have all these employees their product is going national and it's super exciting. But usually when that business is at that peak, if you talk to them, they're like, I just really would rather be back down here again. Because it gets, you have to go over this hump of, I can't do it. I can't do it. I got to hire people. Mm -hmm. I got to hire people. Oh, we're here. And by then you're like, oh, now I miss making that handmade, handmade pasta. Mm -hmm. And nobody knows, I don't get to see anybody eat it anymore. And so there's like this interesting threshold and, and you know, and some of those continue to go on and some stay. Um that's kind of an interesting progress to watch. And that's those ones you see and hear about. You don't hear the detail, but like someone's like, oh, why did XYZ business make it? And they're being recognized. How come the news, newspaper always posts about them and not me? You know, it's hard stuff. To, as a small business owner, it's hard stuff to process and understand. So if you had to pick a couple mm -hmm. stories that you think epitomizes the moment we're in right now mm -hmm. for you know, sort of small business, whether it be a restaurant or even just, uh, you know, another small business that's yeah. doing a, more of a service-oriented work, what would be some of those stories that you think really just talk about this moment that we need to solve? Yeah, and I talked about, I, you know, right currently in this situation that comes to my mind that I want to talk about that I was talking about at that meeting as well is we have five liked like businesses. So they're producing a very similar product. And the great thing about a lot of Madison businesses is they have this mentality already, which is what we push at Dane by Local is collaborate, not compete. Because as soon as you compete, then there's a bad guy and then it starts mm -hmm. to become toxic and then you tear it apart and then, oh, there goes a, a chain restaurant. Um, so right now we have what, there's five of these businesses locally that we're talking with. They all produce almost the same exact product, but slightly different. And the one company, they have a really, really good marketing person, and that's why their product is successful, but they can't pay for the equipment being used to make that product anymore. And if they don't get it paid by the end of the year, they may have to file for bankruptcy. Over here, they're having a really successful social situation, like people are coming, people are going, their location's great, but the owners are like, done. We, bur we burned ourselves out trying to build up this, which everyone else wants. And over here, we're like, yeah, we've got the you know policy down, we've got the handbook down, we've got payroll down, and we've got distribution down, but you know we don't have any passion, right? So each one of these businesses is on the brink of either stepping away and either selling their business. One is one interested in selling or moving out, and the other four are at the brink of like, I'm going to have to shut down or file for bankruptcy. And what we're looking at right now is the potential of a shared services co-op Mm. So that each one of them can bring a skill set to the table. And that way, um, so the Metro bus just drove by. I'm just trying to think of an example because I can't use the actual industry. Um, so logistics. So rather than the person that's driving the bus also having to, at the end of their shift, do marketing 
and restocking shelves or whatever mm-hmm. it is, like rather than one, this one business running themselves dry financially or emotionally or whatever, like spreading that workload out and saving money and, and working towards the benefit of the whole community. Because if these five businesses stay together, our community will be stronger mm-hmm. because they do provide jobs. They provide, you know, a lot of value. And I think that's one last thing about that part of it is people should look at the research we do it. Lots of people do it. Um, DMA Local does. But the research on the return on a dollar, we will preach that forever and ever and ever. A chain dollar is like about a third of that dollar comes back to the community, whereas three times that dollar comes back to the community. And it's way more when it's a restaurant. Like 60.7% of the profits from a business go back into the community, whereas only about 30 cent, 30% stay when it's a chain. And that's because they want to give back to their community. Their staff are local, but then they're like, well, we want to we give back. So the, the nonprofits go up, the giving goes up. So holding those, holding place for those local businesses is so important. But our, as a community, we're not holding. They're holding that space for us and making us feel like we're in a space together. But we're not, the community as a whole is not doing the same back for them. We're not putting the structure and the systems in place and communicating about Ultimately, that's it. It's just talking about it so that that is a strong enough community until we can support them. <laughs> but you kind of hit at at um, sort of the crux of the problem too is people who maybe used to be able to support, yeah, can't support in the same way anymore. Yes, and so, like you said, they might have gone out to eat once a yep. week, and they they just can't do that with a family of four yeah um anymore or they want to you know whatever it might yeah. be it just has made it more difficult and i don't know have you had many ideas with people that you've um talked to or worked with that maybe could bridge that gap uh i'm not sure i understand bridge what gap the gap well, or the, the 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 kind of that moment where you know uh, here's an example. Um, food trucks. Mm-hmm. In some ways, food trucks don't have the the issue of um, rent and all of those things. But if they're parked in a place that's nice, somebody could, a family could still have a meal and have community, et cetera. But you kind of lack that that's community of a restaurant. Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to think, are there, there are other things that can be done? Yeah. Well, one of the things that we've been encouraging the Dane by local businesses to do is if you pick almost three unrelated things, like um, logistics, <laughs> just like all I see a U-Haul truck outside the window. That's not a good example, but they and, and join together and host one event rather than a brewery and a fishing store and a bookstore all holding one event on the same night and making people have to choose where they're going to spend their money. Mm have one joint event, you would each invest so much less. And if that way, if it doesn't turn out for you, no one's out anything. And you're the fish people now know about this bookstore. I didn't even know you had these books. The bookstore now has, there's definitely crossover between people that love to have a local brew and right. So there's this crossover that starts to happen and that builds that community because mm-hmm. you show, you start showing up in spaces and you feel like I could afford to do this. And I met a whole bunch of new people and I felt like I was part of something rather than showing up trying to get to one event and there's five people there and they're the same five people you might see every time you go to these events, you know, start spreading around some of that. Um, and we are seeing a lot of success with that, even at our level, like chambers, nonprofits, we're doing all doing the same thing because none of us can afford right now. The donations are not there. The, so, the funding isn't there. So if four of us as an organization get together, that means our members get to meet three other chambers members and it's not the same network pool every time. Mm-hmm. So then they get to spread their community more. So it's just a better, it's right now, it's the only thing that, the only bridge that I can see that really works well. You know, people used to be able like, let's have a fun party in the park and we'll have free music and we'll hand out ice cream. Well, the ice cream stores can't afford to hand out free ice cream very much anymore. And the free music, like that's all, we can't give anybody free anything anymore because we yeah. need to value every person. Right. You know, internships, right. you know, that shouldn't be free anymore. So, I mean, they're all really very valuable evolutions. Um, but it means that the climate and the 
systems have to change all the way down. So just finding those new ways that still show high value of people's rights <laughs> and needs is, I guess, ultimately, and it's going to have to happen through collaboration and communication, and just well, groups of groups of people working together. Yeah, uh, I think your your comment earlier, collaboration, not competition, mm -hmm. is really the key. And I do really see that in this community. Yeah. Since working with Dane County Food Collective, I just cannot get over how collaborative yeah. everybody is. It's been really yeah. awesome to see. It's beautiful. It's a lovely because mm -hmm. there really is enough people to eat the same food, right? To eat the food or drink cream coffee. And if you're supporting each other through the harder times, the idea, you know, the potential of making it through it is going to be much better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. It's a, it's a hard it's really hard for people to let go of. And it's really hard for us to have to talk to business owners and be like, it's okay, you don't need to compete. You know, like there's, we have a bike shop owner in Madison and there was a new bike shop owner opening maybe two blocks from him. And, and I was like, well, how do you feel about that? And have you met him? And he's like, oh yeah, he's the, new, the old owner, right? The existing owner sat down with me and gave me all the, uh, this is what works best. This is what doesn't work. This is what I sell. Maybe you could sell similar things. And like there is enough people riding bikes that both of us can survive as long as we're not wasting money and resources trying to compete against each other. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to have a better set of whatever than mm -hmm. I'm going to offer. And I just, to me, that's amazing. And so, and they collaborate. Like we have four different bike shops or three different bike shops in town that all collaborate on rides, you know, and they're like, I don't care this, your bike ride people came along on my bike ride. Right. It's about riding bikes and mm -hmm. encouraging the community and, and they need bike mechanics. They're just a shortage of bike mechanics coming up. So the more people that are biking, the more I have an interest in fixing bikes. It all kind of feeds itself. Mm -hmm. So I think as we think about Dane by Local mm -hmm. and your role within the you know county and the community, what do you think are some of the pieces that are the most important? for you all to help these small businesses? Listening. Listening. Yeah, 100% uh, above everything else is listening and receiving the information. And oftentimes it's just giving it back with options. Mm. Um, typically we meet with somebody and it takes at least an hour. And what are you What are you struggling with? What do you wish you could do? What do you wish you had? What's, what's struggling? We're not, just all those things. And then you can put together a list of here's all the resources locally Here's the people that will do it, trade the resources for you. Here's those that will charge you a lot, but you're going to get this. Here's one you want to avoid the monthly fee for, but they're really great to work with. And sometimes that's enough to give people, like just to have them in their hands is enough to like, okay, I'm not alone. Mm -hmm. well, that's the part of that listening is just we say this over and over, you're not alone. You are not alone. Every business owner that we work with starts out with that thought process is, I don't, no one knows, has any idea what this is like. And it's true because it's unique to your business mm -hmm. and how you built your business. But what's not unique is that everyone feels alone. Yeah. Yeah. That's part of mental health. That's part of every, that's part of marriage. That's part of parenting. That's part of most things in life. You are that, as soon as you start thinking I'm all alone, it's kind of like competing. You start thinking you're alone and that kind of toxic toxicity starts and you lose hope really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that other than listening, then speaking. Like we, I, I will talk to anybody anytime about whatever needs to be talked about because I just, if there's a story to tell, I'm happy to tell it because our businesses don't have the capacity to do it for themselves mostly. <laughs> and they need people just willing to walk around and be like, hey, did you know you can get amazing stuff just down the road? <laughs> <laughs> or yeah, there is somebody that does that locally. And, you know, I, we do a lot of workforce development and it's amazing that same kind of that thought process if you meet with teenagers in high school and it's like, well, I think I want to be a nurse. Like, oh, really? You want to be a nurse? Yeah. Well, what do you want to, what kind of nurse do you want to be? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> you know, do you want to do that? No. Do you want to do that? No. And then like, well, actually what I really wanted to do was I wanted to help animals when they're coming out of an injury. You know, it comes really, really specific, but they're so, we're so used to like generalizing mm -hmm. And like, but no one's going to possibly be interested in a thing I'm interested. Oh, no, there's three people doing that. And one of them rides to be um, to people's homes on a bike to do that work. And they would apprentice, they would shadow you or like have you shadow them and teach you. But that's our minds just naturally work that way. We go mm -hmm. from like, well, this is my thing and nobody could possibly understand 
And it's like, oh, wait, there's all this is happening. So mm-hmm. like, we kind of, I feel like that's our job is to scale out and bring it back in and scale out and bring it back in and, you know, just keep perspective, but spread that, spread that knowledge that there are no bad guys. Hope, hope is a big part of it. Lacey from Rubru Kombucha said to me one day, she's like, yeah, like relentless. I don't know how she said it, but like, you're just constantly full of hope. Do you ever get tired? <laughs> and I'm like, it's not that I have hope, it's that. I hear everybody's hopes and I'm just like, yeah, man, that's so exciting. <laughs> There's a lot of hard stuff, but yeah. So, well, I really appreciate you coming, but let me ask you, it, do you have any parting thoughts that you want to kind of share? Another really quickly though, when you said specific stories, like going to that development meeting, talking to one of their executives and seeing how close-minded that person was about the potential of solar or the potential of um, having someone on site to do like support for the people that will be living there. The the close-mindedness is not, again, it's not a bad guy thing. It's a lack of education and the amount of time and energy it will take for them to learn it. Mm. And so us people like organizations like ours or REAP or... There's so many, even chambers, depending on which city you're in, gathering that information for the developer and going, here's everything that's happening locally around solar. Here's an example of what it's like to have a peer support specialist live in your apartment complex. Here's an example, right? Like a community action coalition is another really great resource. So having, knowing that those exist and just tapping into them, it just, it's really, it's energizing to get that executive to finally go, yes. I'm ready. I'll sit down with you and I will listen. But there's not a single like local solar installer who's going to have the time and right, energy to keep hounding this executive. But we do. Uh-huh. So I guess um, just that there's no bad there's no bad guys and just communicate and you know just keep throwing your like I always talk about like fishing you know just keep throwing your reel out there throwing the bait out and to the right people and you don't have to do the work yourself. It's being done. There's so much redundancy, too. Well, that's what always uh, uh, amazes me is the redundancy. So much of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that for sure, for sure. Yeah, so Fill out the Community Action Coalition's ass- needs assessment. I brought that up at the meeting, too, but we underestimate how many of our major programs in our county and in our state come from, were hatched or born out of the Community Action Coalitions. Mm. Um, Head Start. Planned Parenthood, these are organizations that were just an idea, a response to a needs assessment, and they grow, and have every three years, they redo this needs assessment. Mm. So we're in a space, again, where what are our needs? Talk to them, fill out that form, and so people know where the needs are, and then the community can react and start building programs to fix these, fix these areas, strengthen them. Well, thank you. I really appreciate you coming. 